from stories like Charlie the Chocolate Factory, Matilda. You have an entire short story book by Roald Dahl? That's <laughs> correct. Said, also, the bird friendly giant of Roald Dahl. That's his, like, oh, twins. The twins. And the witches. The witches. Yeah, the witches, the witches, witches. was also good. The uh, twins is the probably book. my favorite, though. Which is you should read us the twits. Twits is good. SEO Trot is really good. At least yeah. I like SEO Trot. Hey, so um, are, are they illustrated by uh, Quentin Blake? No, there are no illustrations for the short stories. No illustrations? No That's illustrations. Awful. These are not for children. These are for adults. But sir, Wait, who well, does well, have adults can have illustrations. Conversations. No, adults can't have illustrations. Yes, they adults, can. Adults are serious. <laughs> <laughs> adults are soulless. Serious. Adults are soulless. <laughs> soulless. We're soulless. We just need words. All the words we can get. Pause pictures. It's comic you books. You need picture books because their reading comprehension level hasn't caught up with the rest of the class yet. So yeah, this first one I'm going to read is a little different from his other ones, which are well known for being really dark and having twist endings. Yes, dark. Even his children's books are really dark. Like, yep. Yeah, <laughs> they are really dark children's books. Well, you don't really realize them. Like, uh, George's Marvelous Medicine, he just murders his grandmother because she was kind of a jerk. The Big Friendly Giant is about a race of giant people who sneak in and eat children. Yeah, the witches. That's pretty depressing yeah. at the end. I mean, the twits are two married <laughs> couple who keep fighting until they kill one another. Well, they deserve that. Yeah, because they're twits, but still. <laughs> right. You can read the yeah. story now. I, okay, that's true. Anyway, so this book is organized chronologically. So this is his, one of the earliest short stories. It has some interesting features, because in reality, he fought in World War II and was a fighter pilot. And this story is about a couple of fighter pilots on Breaking Cairo. And little details like the plane he flew will be the plane they fly in the story. All right, but speak up, because you're not very loud. Uh, let's see. Can we fix that easily? <coughs> Maybe not. Let's fix it. So this is already at max. Well, it's probably loud enough. Just read it. Yeah. yeah, I'll speak up a little bit. Should be all right. You can change it in the toolbar if needed. All right. So this week's story is Madame Rosette by. Roald Dahl. It was written in 1945. Damn! I wasn't born then. Correct. Oh, Jesus. This is wonderful, said the stag. Oh, did we get someone new? Yep. Hi, Stacy. Stacy, you Yeah, what happened, Stacy? Stacy, we're already pretty far into the story. We're just about to start. <laughs> oh, like six words. You should start over. Okay. Yes, <laughs> that's going to happen. <laughs> Didn't even make it past the first sentence. I'm sorry. Fine, I'll just leave and go shower, and you can enjoy your secret story without me. Yes. <laughs> okay. The victory is ours. What? So the victory is ours. <laughs> Not very nice. No. I'm not very nice. Either. I'm gonna make up my own story around what is it like the last sentence or something? No, no. It's the first no. sentence. The first. No, it's the very first sentence. <laughs> they they <laughs> lied to you. Lied. Well, we were telling the other two. Can I um? Are you starting? Are you really starting? Or can I like go tower? You really? Starting? Oh, we're we're actually about to start. Really starting. <laughs> All right. Okay, right, back to the story. Oh, Jesus, this is wonderful, said the stag. He was lying back in the bath with the scotch and soda in one hand and a cigarette in the other. The water was right up to the brim. 
and he was like, keeping it warm. What? Send the stag. The stag is the person. Alright, never mind. I was imagining a deer, so I need the image straight. No, this is about people, like most stories. The water was right up to the brim, and he was keeping it warm by turning the tap with his toes. He raised his head and took a little sip of his whiskey. Then he lay back and closed his eyes. For God's sake, get out! said a voice from the next room. Come on, stag! We've had over an hour! Stuffy was sitting on the edge of the bed with no clothes on, drinking slowly and waiting his turn. The stag said, All right, I'm letting the water out now. And he stretched out a leg and flipped up the plug with his toes. Stuffy stood up and wandered into the bathroom, holding his drink in his hand. The stag lay in the bath for a few moments more. Then, balancing his glass carefully on the soap rack, he stood up and reached for a towel. His body was short and square, with strong, thick legs and exaggerated calf muscles. He had coarse, curly ginger hair and a thin, rather pointed face covered with freckles. There was a layer of pale ginger hair on his chest. Jesus, he said looking down into the bathtub. I brought half the desert with me. Stuffy said, Wash it out. Let me get in. I haven't had a bath for five months. This was back in the early days when we were fighting the Italians in Libya. One flew very hard in those days because there were not many pilots. They certainly could not send out any from England because they were fighting the Battle of Britain. So the one remained for long periods out in the desert, living the strange, unnatural life of the desert, living in the same dirty little tent, washing and shaving every day in a mug full of one's own spat-out toothpaste, all the time picking flies out of one's tea and out of one's food, having sandstorms which were as much in the tents as outside them, so that placid men became bloody-minded and lost their tempers with their friends and themselves. Having dysentery and jippy tummy and mastoid and desert sores. Having some bombs from the Italian S-79s. Having no <laughs> water and no women. Having no flowers growing out of the ground. Having very little except sand, sand, sand. One flew old Gloucester gladiators against the Italian CR-42s, and when one was not flying, it was difficult to know what to do. Occasionally, one would catch scorpions, put them in empty petrol cans, and match them against each other in fierce mortal combat. Always there would be a champion scorpion in the squadron, a sort of Joe Lewis who was invincible and won all his fights. He would have a name. He would become famous, and his training diet would be a great secret known only to the owner. Training diet was considered very important with scorpions. Some were trained on corned beef, some on a thing called machonachis, which is an unpleasant canned meat stew. Some on live beetles, and there were others who were persuaded to take a little beer just before the fight on the premise that it made the scorpion happy and gave him confidence. These last ones always lost. But there were great battles and great champions, and in the afternoon, when the flying was over, one could often see a group of pilots and airmen standing around in a circle on the sand, bending over with their hands on their knees, watching the fight, exhorting the scorpions and shouting at them as people shout at boxers or wrestlers in a ring. Then there would be a victory, and the man who owned the winner would become excited. He would dance around in the sand, yelling, waving his arms in the air, and extol in a, in a loud voice the virtues of the victorious animal. The greatest scorpion of all was owned by a sergeant called Wishful, who fed him only on marmalade. The animal had an unmentionable name, but he won 42 <coughs> consecutive fights and then died quietly in training, just when Wishful was considering the problem of retiring him to stud. 
So you can see that because there were no great pleasures while living in the desert, the small pleasures became great pleasures, and the pleasures of children became the pleasures of grown men. That was true for everyone. For the pilots, the bidders, the riggers, the corporals who cooked the food, and the men who kept the stores. It was true for the stag and for Stuffy. So true that when the two of them wrangled a 48-hour pass and a lift by air into Cairo, and then when they got to the hotel, they were feeling about having a bath, rather as you would feel on the first night of your honeymoon. The stag had dried himself and was lying on the bed with a towel around his waist, with his hands up behind his head, and Stuffy was in the bath, lying with his head against the back of the bath, groaning and sighing with ecstasy. The stag said, Stuffy, yes? What are we going to do now? Women, said Stuffy. We must find some women to take out to supper. The stag said, later, that can wait till later. It was early afternoon. I don't think it can wait, said Stuffy. Yes, said the stag, it can wait. The stag was very old and wise. He never rushed any fences. He was 27, much older than anyone else in the squadron, including the CO, and his judgment was much respected by the others. Let's do a little shopping first, he said. Then what? said the voice from the bathroom. Then we can consider the other situation. There was a pause. Stag. Yes? Do you know any women here? I used to. I used to know a Turkish girl with very white skin called Wenda, and a Yugoslav girl who was six, six inches taller than I called Kiki, and another who I think was Syrian. Can't remember her name. Bring them up, said Stuffy. I've done it. I did it while you were getting the whiskey. They've all gone. It isn't any good. It's never any good, Stuffy said. The stag said, we'll go shopping first. There is plenty of time. In an hour, Stuffy got out of the bath. They both dressed themselves in clean khaki shorts and shirts and wandered downstairs through the lobby of the hotel and out into the bright, hot street. The stag put on his sunglasses. Stuffy said, <coughs> I know. I want a pair of sunglasses. All right. We'll go and buy some. They stopped Agari, got in, and told the driver to go to Cicerelle. Stuffy bought his sunglasses, and the stag bought some poker dice. Then they wandered out again onto the hot, crowded street. Did you see that girl? said Stuffy. The one who sold us the glasses? Yes, that dark one. Probably Turkish, said Stag. Stuffy said, I don't care what she was. She was terrific. Didn't you think she was terrific? They were walking along the Sharia Kasser El Nil with their hands in their pockets, and Stuffy was wearing the sunglasses which he had just bought. It was this hot, dusty afternoon, and the sidewalk was crowded with Egyptians and Arabs and small boys with bare feet. The flies followed the small boys and buzzed around their eyes, trying to get at the inflammation which was in them which was there because their mothers had done something terrible to those eyes when the boys were young, so that they would not be eligible for military conscription when they grew older. The small boys padded along beside the stag and stuffy, shouting, Baksheesh! Baksheesh! in shrill, insisted voices, and the flies followed the small boys. Hello! Joined us in the middle of a story. Is it just a one story today, by the way? Yeah, it's very long, so we need to keep moving. <coughs> Let's see. <coughs> there was the smell of Cairo, 
which is not like the smell of any other city. It is not from any one thing or from any one place. It comes from everything, everywhere. From the gutters and the sidewalks, from the houses and the shops, and the things in the shops and the food cooking in the shops. From the horses and the dung of the horses in the street, and from the drains. It comes from the people and the way the sun bears down upon the people. And from the way the sun bears down upon the gutters, and the drains, and the horses, and the food, and the refuse in the streets. It is a rare, pungent smell, like something which is sweet, and rotting, and hot, and salty, and bitter, all at the same time. And it is never absent, even in the cool of the early morning. The two pilots walked along slowly among the crowd. Didn't you think she was terrific? said Stuffy. He wanted to know what the stag thought. She was all right. Certainly she was all right. You know what, stag? What? I would like to take that girl out tonight. They crossed over a street and walked on a little further. The stag said, Well, why don't you? Why don't you ring up Rosette? Who in the hell's Rosette? Madam Rosette, said the stag. She is a great woman. They were passing a place called Tim's Bar. It was run by an <coughs> Englishman called Tim Gillifflon, who had been a quartermaster sergeant in the last war, and who had somehow managed to get left behind in Cairo when the army get, went home. Tim's, said the stag. Let's go in. There was no one inside except for Tim, who was arranging his bottles on shelves behind the bar. Well, 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 he said, turning around. Where have you boys been all this time? Hello, Tim. He did not remember them, but he knew by their looks that they were in from the desert. How's my old friend Girzani? he said, turning around and leaning his elbows on the counter. He's bloody close said the stag. He's outside, Mursa. What are you fighting now? Gladiators. Hell, they had those here eight years ago. Stay one still here, said the stag. They're clapped out. They got their whiskey and carried the glasses over to a table in the corner. Stuffy said, Who is this Rosette? The stag took a long drink. <laughs> down the class. She is a great woman, he said. Who is she? She is a filthy whore. All right, said Stuffy. All right. What about her? Well, said Stag, I'll tell you. Madame Rosette runs the biggest brothel in the world. It is said that she can get you any girl that you want in the whole of Cairo. Bullshit. No, it's true. You just ring her up and tell you tell her where you saw the woman, where she was working, what shop, and at which counter, together with an accurate description, and she will do the rest. Now don't be such a bloody fool, said Stuffy. It's true. It's absolutely true. Thirty three squadron told me about her. They were pulling your leg. All right. You go and look her up in the phone book. She won't be in the phone book under that name. I'm telling you, she is, said Stag. Go and look her up under Rosette. You'll see I'm right. Stuffy did not believe him, but he went over to Tim and asked him for a telephone directory and brought it back to the table. He opened it and turned the pages until he came to ROS. He ran his finger down the column. Rosepi, Rosary, Rosette. There it was, <coughs> Rosette, madam. And the address and telephone number clearly printed in the book. The stag was watching him. Got it? He said. Yes, here it is. Madam Rosette. Well, why don't you go and ring her up? What shall I say? 
The stag looked down into his glass and poked the ice with his finger. Tell her you were a colonel, he said. Colonel Higgins. She mistrusts pilot officers. And tell her that you have seen a beautiful dark girl selling sunglasses at Cicerelle's, and that you would like, as you put it, to take her out to dinner. There isn't a telephone here. Oh, yes, there is. There's one over there. Stuffy looked around and saw the telephone on the wall at the end of the bar. I haven't got a piastre piece. Well, I have, said Stag. He fished in his pocket and put a piastre on the table. Tim will hear everything I say. What the hell does that matter? He probably rings her up himself. You're windy, he added. You're a shit, said Stuffy. Stuffy was just a child. He was 19, seven whole years younger than the stag. He was fairly tall, and he was thin, with a lot of black hair and a handsome, wide-mouthed face, which was coffee brown from the sun of the desert. He was unquestionably the finest pilot in the squadron, and already in those early days, his score was 14 Italians confirmed and destroyed. On the ground, he moved slowly and lazily, like a tired person, and he thought slowly and lazily, like a sleepy child. But when he was up in the air, his mind was quick, and his movements were quick. So quick that they were like reflex actions. It seemed that he was on the ground, almost as though he was resting, <coughs> as though he was dozing a little in order to make sure that when he got into the cockpit, he would wake up fresh and quick ready for that two hours of high concentration. But Stuffy was away from the aerodrome now, and he had something on his mind which had waked him up, almost like flying. It might not last, but for the moment, anyway, he was concentrating. He looked again in the book for the number, got up, and walked slowly over to the telephone. He put in the piaster, dialed the number, and heard it ringing at the other end. The stag was sitting at the table looking at him, and Tim was still behind the bar, arranging his bottles. Tim was only about five yards away, and he was obviously going to listen to everything that was said. Stuffy felt rather foolish. He leaned against the bar and waited, hoping that no one would answer. Then, click, the receiver was lifted at the other end. And he heard a woman's voice saying, Hello? He said, Hello? Is Madame Rosette there? He was watching Tim. Tim went on arranging his bottles, pretending to take no notice. But Stuffy knew he was listening. This is Madame Rosette. Who is it? Her voice was petulant and gritty. She sounded as if she did not want to be bothered with anyone just then. Stuffy, Stuffy tried to sign casual. This is Colonel Higgins. Or it is Colonel Higgins. Oh, yeah. I always do that. <laughs> this is Colonel Higgins. Colonel who? Colonel Higgins. He spelled it. <laughs> yes, Colonel. What do you want? She sounded impatient. Obviously, this was a woman who stood no nonsense. He still tried to sound casual. Well, Madame Rosette, I was wondering if you could help me over a little matter. Stuffy was watching Tim. He was listening all right. You can always tell if someone is listening when he is pretending not to. He is careful not to make any noise about what he is doing, and he pretends that he is concentrating very hard upon his job. Tim was like that now, moving the bottles quickly from one shelf to another, watching the bottles, making no noise, never looking around into the room. Over in the far corner, the stag was leaning forward with his elbows on the table, smoking a cigarette. He was watching Stuffy, enjoying the whole business, and knowing that Stuffy was embarrassed because of Tim. Stuffy had to go on. I was wondering if you could help me, he said. I was in Cirocell's today, buying a pair of sunglasses, and I saw a girl there 
who I would very much like to take out to dinner. What's her name? The hard, rasping voice was more businesslike than ever. I don't know, he said, sheepishly. What's she look like? Well, she's got dark hair, and tall, and, well, she's very beautiful. What sort of dress was she wearing? Er, uh, let me see. I think it was kind of white dress, with red flowers printed all over it. Then, as a brilliant afterthought, he added, she had a red belt. We remember that she had been wearing a shiny red belt. There was a pause. Stuffy watched him, who wasn't making any noises with the bottles. He was picking them up carefully and putting them down carefully. Then the loud, gritty voice again. It may cost you a lot. That's all right. Suddenly, he didn't like the conversation anymore. He wanted to finish it and get away. Might cost you ten pounds. Must co might, cost, uh, might cost you six pounds. Might cost you eight or ten. I don't know until I've seen her. That's that all right? Yes, yes, that's all right. Where are you living, Colonel? Colonel? Metropolitan Hotel, he said without thinking. All right, I give you a ring later. And she put down the receiver. Bang. Stuffy hung up, went slowly back to the table, and sat down. Well, said Stag, that was all right, wasn't it? Yes, I suppose so. What did she say? She said she would call me back at the hotel. You mean she'll call Colonel Higgins at the hotel? Stuffy said, Oh, Christ! Stag said, It's all right. We'll tell the desk that the Colonel is in our room and look his calls through to us. What else did she say? She said it may cost me a lot. Six or ten pounds. Rosette will take 90% of it, said Stag. She's a filthy old boar. How will she work it? Stuffy said. He was really a gentle person, and now he was feeling worried about having starting something which might become complicated. Well, said Stag. She'll dispatch one of her pimps to locate the girl and find out who she is. If she's already on the books, then it's easy. Mm -hmm. If she isn't, the pimp will proposition her there, and then over the counter at Cicerelle's. If the girl tells him to go to hell, he'll up the price. And if she still tells him to go to hell, he'll up the price still more. And in the end, she'll be tempted by the cash, and probably agree. Mm -hmm. Then, Rosette quotes you a price three times as high, and takes the balance herself. You have to pay her, not the girl. Of course, after that, the girl goes on Rosette's books. And once she's in her clutches, she's finished. Next time, Rosette will dictate the price, and the girl will not be in a position to argue. Why? Because if she refuses, Rosette will say, All right, my girl, I see that you, I shall see that your employers, the Sir Sirelles, also are told about <coughs> what you did last time, how you've been working for me and using their shop as a marketplace, then they'll fire you. That's what Rosette will say. And the wretched girl will be frightened and do what she's told. Stuffy said, Sounds like a nice person. <laughs> Who? Madame Rosette. Charming, said Stag. She's a charming person. It was hot. Stuffy wiped his face with his handkerchief. More whiskey, said Stag. Hi, Tim. Two more of those. Tim brought the glasses over and put them on the table without saying anything. He picked up the empty glasses and went away at once. To Stuffy, it seemed as though he was a different person from what he had been when they first came in. He wasn't cheery anymore. He was quiet and offhand. There wasn't any more, Hi, fellows, where you been all this time? about him now. And when he got back behind the counter, he turned his back 
and went on arranging the bottles. The stag said, How much money you got? Nine pounds, I think. May not be enough. You gave her a free hand, you know. You ought to have set a limit. She'll sting you now. I know, Stuffy said. They went on drinking for a little while without talking. Then Stag said, What are you worrying about, Stuffy? Nothing, he answered. Nothing at all. Let's go back to the hotel. She may ring up. They paid for their drinks and said goodbye to Tim, who nodded, but didn't say anything. They went back to the Metropolitan, and as they went past the desk, the stag said to the clerk, mm -hmm. If a call comes in for Colonel Higgins, put it through to our room. He'll be there. The Egyptian said, Yes, sir, and made a note of it. In the bedroom, the stag lay down on his bed and lit a cigarette. And what am I going to do tonight, he said. <coughs> Stuffy had been quiet all the way back to the hotel. He hadn't said a word. Now he sat down on the edge of the other bed with his hands still in his pockets and said, Look, Stag, I'm not very keen on this rosette deal anymore. It may cost too much. Can't we put it on? The Stag sat up. Hell no, he said. You're committed. You can't fool around with Rosette like that. She's probably working on it at this moment. You can't back out now. I may not be able to afford it, Stuffy said. Well, wait and see. Stuffy got up, went over to the parachute bag, and took out the bottle of whiskey. He poured out two, filled the glasses with water from the tap in the bathroom, came back and gave one to the stag. Stag, he said, bring up Rosette and tell her that Colonel Higgins had to leave town urgently to rejoin his regiment in the desert. Bring her up and tell her that. Say the Colonel asked you to deliver the message because he didn't have time. Bring her up yourself. She'd recognize my voice. Come on, Stag, you bring her. No, he said, I won't. Listen, said Stuffy suddenly. It was the child Stuffy speaking. I don't want to go out with that woman. I don't want to have any dealings with Madame Rosette tonight. We can think of something else. The stag looked up quite quickly. Then he said, All right, I'll ring her. He reached for the phone book, looked up her number, and spoke it into the telephone. Stuffy heard him get her on the line, and he heard him giving her the message from the colonel. Then there was a pause, and Stag said, I'm sorry, Madame Rosette, but it's nothing to do with me. I'm merely delivering a message. Another pause. Then the Stag said the same thing over again, and that went on for quite a long time, until he must have got tired of it, because in the end, he put down the receiver and lay back on his bed. He was roaring with laughter. <laughs> that lousy old bitch, he said. And he laughed some more. Stuffy said, Was she angry? Angry, said Stag. Was she angry? You should have heard her. Wanted to know the colonel's regiment and God knows what else. He said he'd have to pay. She said, You boys think you can fool around with me, but you can't. Huh? Hooray, said Stuffy. The filthy old whore. Now what are we going to do? Said the stag. It's six o'clock already. Let's go out and do a little drinking in one of those jippy places. Fine. We'll do a jippy pub crawl. They had one more drink. Then they went out. They went to a place called the Excelsior. Then they went to a place called the Sphinx then to a small place by an Egyptian name. And by 10 o'clock, they were sitting happily in a place which hadn't got a name at all, drinking beer and watching a kind of stage show. At the Sphinx, they had picked up a pilot from 33 Squadron who said that his name was William. 
He was about the same age as Stuffy, but his face was younger, for he had not been flying so long. It was especially around his mouth that he was younger. He had a round schoolboy face with a small turned up nose, and his skin was brown from the desert. The three of them sat happily in the place without a name, drinking beer, because beer was the only thing that they served there. It was a long wooden room with an unpolished wooden sawdust floor and wooden tables and chairs. At the far end, there was a raised wooden stage where there was a show going on. The room was full of Egyptians, sitting, drinking black coffee with the red tarbushes on their heads. There were two fat girls on the stage, dressed in shiny silver pants and silver brassiers. One was waggling her bottom in time to the music. The other was waggling her bosom in time to the music. The bosom waggler was the most skillful. He could waggle one bosom without waggling the other. And sometimes she would waggle her bottom as well. The Egyptians were spellbound and kept giving her a big hand. The more they clapped, the more she waggled. And the more she waggled, the faster the music played. And the faster the music played, the faster she waggled. Faster and faster and faster, never losing the tempo, never losing the fixed brassy smile that was upon her face. And the Egyptians clapped more and more, and louder and louder as the speed increased. Everyone was very happy. When it was over, William said, Why do they always have those jury fat women? Why don't they have beautiful women? The stag said, The gypsies like them fat. They like them like that. Impossible, said Stuffy. It's true, stag said. It's an old business. It comes from the days when there used to be lots of famines here, and all the poor people were thin, and all the rich people in the aristocracy were well-fed and fat. If you got someone fat, you couldn't go wrong. She was bound to be high class. Bullshit, said Stuffy. William said, Well, we'll soon find out. I'm going to ask those jippies. He jerked his thumb toward the two middle-aged Egyptians who were sitting at the next table, only about four feet away. No, said Stag. No, William. We don't want them over here. Yes, said Stubby. Yes, said William. We've got to find out why the jippies like fat women. He was not drunk. None of them were drunk, but they were happy with a fair amount of beer and whiskey and William was the happiest. His brown schoolboy face was radiant with happiness. His turned up nose seemed to have turned up a little more, and he was probably relaxing for the first time in many weeks. He got up, took three paces over to the table of the Egyptians, and stood in front of them, smiling. Gentlemen, he said, my friends and I would be honored if you would join us at our table. The Egyptians had dark, greasy skin and podgy faces. They were wearing the red hats, and one of them had a gold tooth. At first, when William addressed them, they looked a little alarmed. Then they got on, looked at each other, grinned, and nodded. Please, said one. Please, said the other. And they got up, shook hands with William, and followed him over to where the stag and Stuffy were sitting. William said, Meet my friends. This is the stag, this is Stuffy. I am William. The stag and Stuffy stood up. They all shook hands. The Egyptians said, Please, once more. And then everyone sat down. The stag knew that their religion forbade them to drink. Have a coffee he said. The one with the gold tooth grinned broadly, raised his hands, palms upward, and hunched his forward shoulders a little. For me, he said, I am accustomed. 
but for my friend, and he spread out his hands towards the other, for my friend, I cannot speak. The stag looked at the friend. Coffee? he asked. Please, he answered. I am accustomed. Good, said Stad. Two coffees. He called a waiter. Two coffees, he said. And, wait a minute. Stuffy, William, more beer? For me, Stuffy said. I am accustomed. But for my friend, and he turned toward William, for my friend, I cannot speak. William said, please, I am accustomed. None of them smiled. The stag said, good, waiter, two coffees and three beers. The waiter fetched the order and the stag said, and the stag paid. The stag lifted his glass toward the Egyptians and said, Bung ho. Bung ho, said Stuffy. Bung ho, said William. The Egyptians seemed to understand, and they lifted their coffee cups. Please, said one. Thank you, said the other. They drank. The stag put down his glass and said, It is an honor to be in your country. You like? Yes, said the stag. Very fine. The music had started again and the two fat women in silver tights were doing an encore. The encore was a knockout. It was surely the most remarkable exhibition of muscle control that has ever been witnessed. For although the bottom waggler was still just waggling her bottom, the bosom waggler was standing like an oak tree in the center of the stage with her arms above her head. Her left bosom was rotating in a clockwise direction and her right bosom in an anti-clockwise direction. At the same time, she was waggling her bottom, and it was all in time to the music. <laughs> Gradually, the music increased its speed, and as it got faster, the rotating and the waggling got faster, <laughs> and some of the Egyptians were so spellbound by the contra-rotating bosoms of the woman that they were unconsciously following the movements of the bosom with their hands, holding their hands up in front of them and describing circles in the air. Everyone stamped their feet and screamed with delight, and the two women on stage continued to smile their fixed, grassy smiles. Then it was over. The applause gradually died down. Remarkable, said the stag. You like? Please, it was remarkable. Those girls, said the one with the gold tooth, very special. William couldn't wait any longer. He leaned across the table and said, Might I ask you a question? Please, said Golden Tooth, please. Well, said William, how do you like your women? Like this, slim, and he demonstrated with his hands. Or like this, fat. The gold tooth shone brightly behind a big grin. For me, I like like this, fat. And a pair of podgy hands drew a big circle in the air. And your friend, said William. For my friend, he answered. I cannot speak. Please, said the friend. Like this. He grinned and drew a fat girl in the air with his arms. Stuffy said, Why do you like them fat? Golden Tooth thought for a moment. Then he said, You like them slim, eh? Please, said Stuffy. I like them slim. Why do you like them slim? You tell me. Stuffy rubbed the back of his neck with the palm of his hand. William, he said. Why do we like them slim? For me, said William. I am accustomed. So am I, Stuffy said. 
But why? William considered. I don't know, he said. I don't know why we like them, Slim. Ha, said Golden Tooth. You don't know. He leaned over the table toward William and said triumphantly, And me, I do not know either. But that wasn't good enough for William. The stag, he said, says that all rich people in Europe and Egypt used to be fat, and all the poor people were thin. No, said Golden Tooth. No, no, no. Look at those girls up there. Very fat, very poor. Look at Queen of Egypt, Queen Farida. Very thin, very rich. Quite wrong. Yes, but what about years ago? said William. What is this, years ago? William said. Oh, all right. Let's leave it. The Egyptians drank their coffee and made noises like the last bit of water running out of the bathtub. When they had finished, they got up to go. Going? said the stag. Please, said Golden Tooth. William said, thank you, Stuffy said. Please, the other Egyptian said, please, and Stag said, thank you. They all shook hands and the Egyptians departed. Ropey types, said William. Very, said Stuffy. Very ropey types. The three of them sat on, drinking happily until midnight, when the waiter came up and told them that the place was closing and that there were no more drinks. They were not really drunk because they had been taking it slowly, but they were feeling healthy. He says we've got to go. All right, where shall we go? Where shall we go, Stag? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Let's go to another place like this, said William. This is a fine place. There was a pause. Stuffy was stroking the back of his neck with his hand. Stag, he said slowly. I know where I want to go. I want to go to Madame Rosette's, and I want to rescue all the girls there. Who's Madame Rosette? William said. She is a great woman, said the stag. She's a filthy whore, said Stuffy. She is a lousy old bitch, said the stag. All right, said William. Let's go. But who is she? They told him who she was. They told him about their telephone calls and about Colonel Higgins. And William said, come on, let's go. Let's go and rescue all the girls. They got up and left. When they were outside, they remembered that they were in a rather remote part of the town. We'll have to walk a bit, said Stag. No Gari's here. It was a dark, starry night with no moon. The street was narrow and blacked out. It smelled strongly with the smell of Cairo. It was quiet as they walked along, and now and then they passed a man or two, or sometimes two men, standing in the shadow of a house, leaning against the wall of the house, smoking. I say, said William. Ropey? What? Very, said Stuffy. Very bad types. They walked on, the three of them walking abreast. Square, short, ginger-haired stag, tall, dark, stuffy. And tall, young William, who went bareheaded because he had lost his cap. They headed roughly toward the center of town, where they knew that they would find the Gary to take them on to Rosette. Stuffy said, Oh, won't the girls be pleased when we rescue them? Jesus, said the stag. It ought to be a party. Does she actually keep them all locked up? William said. Well, no, said stag. Not exactly. But if we rescue them now, they won't have to work any more tonight, anyway. You see, the girls she has at her place are nothing but ordinary shop girls 
who still work during the day in the shops. They have all of them made so they have all of them made some mistake or other, which Rosette either engineered or found out about. And now she has put the screws on them. She makes them come along in the evening. But they hate her, and they do not depend on her for a living. They would kick her in the teeth if they got the chance. Stuffy said, We'll give them the chance. They crossed over a street. William said, How many girls will be there, Stag? I don't know. I suppose there might be 30. Good God, said William. This will be a party. Does she really treat them very badly? The Stag said, 33 Squadron told me she pays them nothing, about 20 acres a night. She charges the customers 100 or 200 acres each. Each girl earns for Rosette between 500 and 1,000 acres every night. Good God, said William. A thousand piaster a night and 30 girls? She must be a millionaire. She is. Someone calculated that not even counting her outside business. She makes the equivalent of about 1,500 pounds a week. That's, let me see, that's between five and 6,000 pounds a month. 60,000 pounds a year. Stuff he came out of his dream. Jesus, he said, Jesus Christ, the filthy old whore. The lousy old bitch, said William. They were coming into a more civilized section of the town, but still, there were no Garys. The stag said, did you hear about Mary's house? What Mary's house, said William. It's a place in Alexandria. Mary is the rosette of Alex. Lousy old bitch, said William. No, Stag said. They say she's a good woman, but anyway, Mary's house was hit by a bomb last week. The Navy was in port at the time, and the place was full of sailors, sailors, nautic types. Killed? Lots of them killed. And you know what happened? They posted them as killed in action. The Admiral is a gentleman, said Stuffy. Magnificent, said William. Then they saw Gary and hailed it. Stuffy said, We don't know the address. He'll know it, said Stag. Madam Rosette, he said to the driver. The driver grinned and nodded. Then William said, I'm going to drive. Give me the reins, driver, and sit up here beside me and tell me where to go. The driver protested vigorously, but when William gave him ten piaster, he gave him the reins. William sat up high on the driver's seat with the driver beside him. The stag and Suffy got back in the back of the carriage. Take off, said Stuffy. William took off. The horses began to gallop. No good, shrieked the driver. No good, stop! Which way, Rosette? shouted William. Stop! shrieked the driver. William was happy. Rosette, he shouted, which way? The driver made a decision. He decided that the only way to stop this madman was to get him to his destination. This way, he shrieked. Left! William pulled hard on the left brake, and the horses swerved around the corner. The Gary took it on one wheel. Too much bank, shouted Stuffy from the back seat. Which way now, shouted William. Left, shrieked the driver. They took the next street to the left, then they took the one to the right, two more to the left, then one to the right again. And suddenly the driver yelled. Here, please! Here, Rosette, stop! William pulled hard on the reins, and gradually the horses raised their heads with the pulling and slowed down to a trot. Where? said William. Here, said the driver. Please! He pointed 20 yards ahead. 
William brought the horses to a stop right in front of it. Nice work, William, said Stumpy. Jesus, said the stag. That was quick. Marvelous, said William. Wasn't it? He was very happy. The driver was sweating through his shirt, and he was too frightened to be angry. William said, How much? Please, twenty piastre. William gave him forty, and said, Thank you very much. Fine horses. The little man took the money, jumped onto the gary, and drove off. He was in a hurry to get away. They were in another one of those narrow, dark streets, but the houses, what they could see of them, looked huge and preposterous. The one which the driver had said was Rosette's was wide and thick and three stories high, built of gray concrete, and it had a large, thick front door which stood wide open. As they went in, the stag said, Now, leave this to me. I've got a plan. Inside, there was a cold, gray, dusty stone hall, lit by a bare electric light bulb in the ceiling. And there was a man standing in the hall. He was a mountain of a man, a huge Egyptian with a flat face and two cauliflower ears. In his wrestling days, he had probably been billed as Abdul the Killer, or the Poisonous Pasha. But now he wore a dirty white cotton suit. The stag said, Good evening. Is Madame Rosette here? Abdul looked hard at the three pilots, hesitated, then said, Madame Rosette, top floor. Thank you, said stag. Thank you very much. Stuffy noticed that the stag was being polite. You got some. There was always trouble for somebody when he was like that. Back in the squadron, when he was leading a flight, when they sighted the enemy, and when there was going to be a battle, the stag never gave an order without saying, Please! And he never received a message without saying, Thank you. He was saying, Thank you. Now to Abdul. They went up the bare stone steps, which had iron railings, they went past the first landing, and the second landing, and the place was as bare as a cave. At the top of the third flight of steps, there was no landing. It was walled off, and the stairs ran up to a door. The stag pressed the bell. They waited for a while, then a little panel in the door slid back, and a pair of small black eyes peeked through. A woman's voice said, What do you boys want? Both the stag and Stuffy recognized the voice from the telephone. The stag said, We would like to see Madame Rosette. He pronounced the Madame in the French way because he was being polite. You officers? Only officers here, said the voice. She had a voice like a broken board. Yes, said the stag. We are officers. You don't look like officers. What kind of officers? R.A.F. There was a pause. The stag knew what she was considering. She had probably had trouble with pilots before, and he hoped only that she would not see William and the light that was dancing in his eyes. For William was starting to feel the way he had felt when he drove the Gary. Suddenly, the panel closed and the door opened. All right, come in, she said. She was too greedy, this woman, even to pick her customers carefully. They went in, and there she was, short, fat, greasy, with wisps of untidy black hair strangling over her forehead. A large, mud-colored face, a large, wide nose, and a small fish mouth with just the trace of the black mustache above her. She had a loose black hair. Come into the office, boys, 
she said, and started to waddle down the passage to the left. It was a long, wide passage, about 50 yards long and four or five yards wide. It ran through the middle of the house, parallel with the street. And as you came in from the stairs, you had to turn left along it. All the way down, there were doors, about eight or ten of them on each side. And if you turned right as you came in from the stairs, you ran into the end of the passage. But there was one door there, too. And as the three of them walked, in behind the door that it was the girl's dressing room. This way, boys, said Rosette. She turned left and sloped down the passage away from the door with the voices. The three followed her, Stag first, then Stuffy, then William, down the passage, which had a red carpet on the floor and huge pink lampshades hanging from the ceiling. They got about halfway down the passage, when there was a yell from the dressing room behind them. Rosette stopped and looked around. You go on, boys, she said. Into the office. Last door on the left. I won't be a minute. She turned and went back toward the dressing room door. They didn't go on. They stood and watched her. And just as she got to the door, it opened, and a girl rushed out. Where they stood, they could see that her fair hair was falling all over her face, and that she had on an untidy-looking green evening dress. She saw Rosette in front of her, and she stopped. They heard Rosette say something, something angry and quickly spoken. And they heard the girl shout something back at her. They saw Rosette raise her right arm, and they saw her hit the girl smack on the side of the face with the palm of her hand. They saw her draw her hand back and hit her again in the same place. She hit her hard. The girl put her hands up to her face and began to cry. Rosette opened the door of the dressing room and pushed her back inside. Jesus, said the stag. She's tough, William said. So am I. Stuffy didn't say anything. Rosette came back to them and said, Come along, boys. Just a bit of trouble, that's it. She led them to the end of the passage and in through the last door on the left. This was the office. It was a medium-sized room with two red plush sofas, two or three red plush armchairs, and a thick red carpet on the floor. In one corner was a small desk, and Rosette sat herself beside it, behind it, facing the room. Sit down, boy, <coughs> she said. Stuffy took an armchair. The stag took an armchair. Stuffy and William sat on the sofa. Well, she said, and her voice became sharp and urgent. Let's do business. The stag leaned forward in his chair. His short ginger hair looked somehow wrong against the bright red plush. Madame Rosette, he said, it is a great pleasure to meet you. We have heard so much about you. Rosette looked at him too, and her little black eyes were suspicious. Believe me, the stag went on, we've really been looking forward to this for quite some time now. His voice was so pleasant and he was so polite that Rosette took it. That's nice of you boys, she said. You'll always have a good time here. I see that. Now, business. William couldn't wait any longer. He said slowly, The stag says that you're a great woman. Thanks, boys, Stuffy said. The stag says that you're a filthy old whore, William said quickly. The stag says you're a lousy old bitch. And I know what I'm talking about, said the stag. Rosette jumped to her feet. What's this? She shrieked. 
and her face was no longer the color of mud. It was the color of red clay. The men did not move. They did not smile or laugh. They sat quite still, leaning forward a little in their seats, watching her. Rosette had had trouble before, plenty of it, and she knew how to deal with it. But this was different. They didn't seem drunk. It wasn't about money, and it wasn't about one of her girls. It was about herself, and she didn't like it. Get out, she yelled. Get out unless you want trouble. But they did not move. For a moment she paused, then she stepped quickly from behind her desk and made for the door. But the stag was there first, and when she went for him, Stuffy and William each cut one of her arms from behind. We'll lock her in, said the stag. Let's get out. Then she really started yelling, and the words which she used cannot be written down on paper, for they were terrible words. They poured out of her small fish mouth in one long, unbroken, high-pitched stream, with little bits of spit and saliva came out with them. Stuffy and William pulled her back by the arms toward one of the big chairs, and she fought and yelled like a large, fat pig being dragged to the slaughter. They got her in front of the chair and gave her a quick push so that she fell backwards into it. Stuffy nipped across to her desk, bent down quickly, and jerked the telephone cord from its connection. The stag had the door open, and all three of them were out of the room before Rosette had time to get up. The stag had taken the key from the inside of the door, and now he locked it. The three of them stood. Jesus, the dad. What a woman. Mad as hell, William said. Listen to her. They stood outside in the passage, and they listened. They heard her yelling, banging on the door. But she went on yelling, and her voice was not the voice of a woman. It was the voice of an enraged, but articulable. The stag said, Now quick, the girls, follow me. And from now on, you've got to act serious. You've got to act serious as hell. He ran down the passage toward the dressing room, followed by Stuffy and William. Outside the door, he stopped, and the other two stopped, and they could still hear Rosette yelling from her office. The stag said, Now don't say anything. Just act serious as hell. And he opened the door and went in. There were about a dozen girls in the room. They all looked up. They stopped talking and looked up at the stag who was standing in the doorway. The stag clicked his heels and said, This is the military police. Les gendarmes militares. He said it in a stern voice. He was standing there in the doorway at attention with his cap on his head. Stuffy William stood beside him. This is the military did Jesus die? Uh oh. What was that? Jesus, are you dead? Oh, are we having problems? You sounded like a robot and then you yeah. went away. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Paging everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Do you no longer sound like a robot, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> you guess. <laughs> what are you trying to say, D-Wang? I take offense. Jesus is uh, always a robot. He always has been. Well, I guess being a robot might be a compliment. Like that would mean you're really good at coding. The internet. No, robots can't write code. Yeah, robots are what are you talking about right now? Oh, wait, that's right. I can, like, 
manufacture small it's parts efficiently. Good <laughs> <laughs> so Vacuum your floor automatically while you're away. No Wait, problem. Jesus! If you're a robot, you could start like. I lost my train of thought. I think we should keep reading. I want to hear what happened to the. This is a morbid story. Yeah, this is. How morbid. much further? How much longer do you think there is? Oh, we're getting pretty close. This is page twenty-five out of thirty. So. We are reaching the thrilling conclusion. Should I go sledding? Should you go swimming? Right sledding. now. Oh, sledding. Right now? I don't know. There's a hill and there's lots of snow, so... Why would you not go sledding? Because it's cold. Yeah, why would you... Also the middle of the night. And also it's April 23rd. Four two three. How did I miss four two three? Oh, no. two, it's it's two, not four two three anymore. It is over here. Uh huh. Oh. Silly oh, Keep juggling. Oh my goodness. We just visited San Francisco. We wouldn't have these problems. Yeah. Why don't you visit San Francisco? That face. Okay. Uh, wait, where did I start going robotic? Do I have to backtrack a bunch? Uh, I don't know. You go uh, robotic and then silent for a little bit. Well, did we get to the point where he entered the room? Yeah. Yes. Alright, okay, that's not very far. Let's just start there again. It's a good place. There were about a dozen girls in the room. They all looked up. They stopped talking and looked at the stag, who was standing in the doorway. The stag clicked his heels and said, This is the military police. The Stenmans Militares. He said it in a stern voice and with a straight face, and he was standing there in the doorway at attention with his cap on his head. Stuffy and William stood behind him. This is the military police, he said again. And he produced his identification card and held it up between two fingers. The girls didn't move or say anything. They stayed still in the middle of what they were doing. And they were like a tableau because they stayed so still. One had been pulling on a stocking and she stayed like that, sitting on a chair with her legs out straight and the stocking up to her knee with her hands on the stocking. One had been doing her hair in front of a mirror, and when she looked round, she kept her hands up to her hair. One was standing up and had been applying lipstick, and she raised her eyes to the stag, but still held the lipstick to her mouth. Several were just sitting around on plain wooden chairs, doing nothing. And they raised their heads and turned them to the door, but they went on sitting. Most of them were in some sort of shiny evening dress. One or two were half clothed. But most of them were in shiny green, or shiny blue, or shiny red, or shiny gold. And when they turned to look at the stag, they were so still that they were like the tableau. The stag paused. Then he said, I am to state on behalf of the authorities that they are very sorry to disturb you. My apologies, mademoiselle, mademoiselles, that, mademoiselles. But it is necessary that you come with us for purposes of registration, etc. Afterwards, you will be allowed to go. It is a mere formality, but now you must come, please. I have conversed with the madame. The stag stopped speaking, but still the girls did not move. Please, said the stag. Get your coats. We are the military. He stepped aside and held the door open. Suddenly, the tableau dissolved. The girls got up, puzzled, murmuring, and two or three of them moved toward the door. The others followed. The ones that were half clothed, or 
quickly slipped into dresses, patted their hair with their hands, and came to. None of them had coats. Count them, said the stag to Stuffy, as they filed out of the door. Stuffy counted them aloud, and there were fourteen. Fourteen, sir, said Stuffy, who was trying to talk like a sergeant major. The stag said, correct. And he turned to the girls who were crowded in the passage. Now, mademoiselles, I have the list of your names from Madame, so please do not try to run away, and do not worry. This is a mere formality of the military. William was out in the passage, opening the door. No, William was out in the passage, opening the door which led to the stairs, and he went out first. The girls followed, and the stag and Stuffy brought up the rear. The girls were quiet and puzzled and worried, and a little frightened when they didn't talk. None of them talked, except for a tall one with black hair, who said, Mon Dieu, a formality of the military? Formality? Mon Dieu, Mon Dieu, what next? Well, that was all, and they went on down. In the hall, they met the Egyptian, who had a flat face and two cauliflower ears. For a moment, it looked as though there would be trouble. But the stag waved his identification card in his face and said, The military police! And the man was so surprised that he did nothing and let them pass. And so they came out onto the street. And the stag said, It is necessary to walk a little way, but only a little way. And they turned right and walked along the sidewalk with the stag leading, Stuffy at the rear, and William walked out on the road guarding his leg. There was some moon now. One could see quite well, and William tried to keep in step with stag, and Stuffy tried to keep in step with William. And they swung their arms and held their heads up high and looked very military. And the whole thing was a sight to behold. Fourteen girls in shiny evening dresses, fourteen girls in the moonlight, in shiny green, shiny blue, shiny red, shiny black, and shiny gold, marching along the street with the stag in front, William alongside, and Stuffy at the rear. It was a sight to behold. The girls had started chattering. The stag could hear them, although he didn't look around. He marched on at the head of the column, and when they came to the crossroads, he turned right. The other followed had walked 50 yards down the block when they came to an Egyptian cafe. The stag saw it, and he saw, saw the lights burning behind the blackout curtains. He turned around and shouted, Halt! The girl stopped. But they went on chattering, and anyone could see that there was now mutiny in the ranks. You can't make 14 girls in high heels and shiny evening dresses march along all over town with you at night. Not for long, anyway. Not for long. Even if it is the formality of the military. This stag knew it. And now he was speaking. Mademoiselles, he said, listen to me. But there was mutiny in the ranks, and they went on talking, and the tall one with dark hair was saying, Mon Dieu, what is this? What in hell's name sort of thing is this? Oh, Mon Dieu! Quiet, said the stag. Quiet! And the second time he shouted it as a command. The talking stopped. Mademoiselles, he said, and now he became polite. He talked to them in his best way, and when the stag was polite, there wasn't anyone who didn't take to it. It was an extraordinary thing, because he could make a kind of smile with his voice, without smiling with his lips. His voice smiled while his face remained serious. It was a most forcible thing, because it gave people the impression that he was being serious about being nice. 
Mademoiselles, he said, and his voice was smiling. With the military, there always has to be formality. It is something unavoidable. It is something that I regret exceedingly. But there can be chivalry also. And you must know that with the RAF, there is great chivalry. So now it will be a pleasure if you all come in here and take with us a glass of beer. It is the chivalry of the military. He stepped forward, opening the door of the cafe, and said, Oh, for God's sake, let us have a drink. Who wants a drink? Suddenly, the girls saw it all. They saw the whole thing as it was, all of them at once. It took them by surprise. For a second, they considered. Then they looked all at one another. Then they looked at the sky. Then they looked around at Stuffy and at William. And when they looked at those two, they caught their eyes and the laughter that was in them. All at once, the girls began to laugh and William laughed, and Stuffy laughed, and they moved forward and poured into the cafe. The tall one with dark hair took the stag by the arm and said, Mon Dieu, military police! Mon Dieu! Oh, mon Dieu! And she threw her head back and laughed, and the stag laughed with it. William said, It is the chivalry of the military and they moved into the cafe. The place was rather like the one they'd been in before, wooden and sawdusty, and there were a few coffee-drinking Egyptians sitting around with the red tarbushes on their head. William and Stuffy pushed three round tables together and fetched chairs. The girls sat down. The Egyptians at the other tables put down their coffee cups, turned around in their chairs and gaped. They gaped like so many fat, muddy fish, and some of them shifted their chairs round, facing the party, so they could get a better view, and they went on deeper. A waitress came up, and the stag said, Seventeen beers. Bring us seventeen beers. The waiter said, Please, and went away. As they sat, waiting for the drinks, the girls looked at the three pilots, and the pilots looked at the girls. William said, It is the chivalry of the military. And the tall, dark girl said, Mon Dieu, you are crazy people. Oh, Mon Dieu. The waiter brought the beer. William raised his glass and said, To the chivalry of the military. The dark girl said, Oh, Mon Dieu. Stuffy didn't say anything. He was busy looking around at the girls, sizing them up, trying to decide now which one he liked best so that he could go to work at once. The stag was smiling, and the girls were sitting there in their shiny evening dresses. Shiny red, shiny gold, shiny blue, shiny green, shiny black, and shiny silver. And once again, it was almost a tableau. Certainly it was a picture. And the girls were sitting there, sipping their beer, seeming quite happy. Not seeming suspicious anymore, because to them, the whole thing appeared exactly as it was, and they understood. Jesus, said the stag. He put down his glass and looked around them. Oh, Jesus, there's enough here for the whole squadron. Oh, I wish the whole squadron was here. He took another drink, stopped in the middle of it, and put down his glass quickly. I know what, he said. Waiter, a oh, waiter, please, get me a big piece of paper and a pencil. Please. The waiter went away and came back with a sheet of paper. He took a pencil from behind his ear and handed it to the stag. The stag banged the table for silence. Mademoiselles, he said, for the last time, there is a formality. It is the last of all the formalities. 
of the military, said William. Oh, mon Dieu, said the dark girl. It is nothing, said the stag. You are required to write your name and your telephone number on this piece of paper. It is for my friends in the squadron. It is so they can be as happy as I am now, but without the same trouble beforehand. And the stag's voice was smiling again. One could see that the girls liked his voice. You would be very kind if you could do that, he went on. For they too would like to meet you. It would be a pleasure. Wonderful, said William. Crazy, said the dark girl. But she wrote her name and number on the paper and passed it on. The stag ordered another round of beer. The girls certainly looked funny sitting there in their dresses, but they were writing their names down on the paper. They looked happy, and William particularly looked happy. But Stuffy looked serious, because the problem of choosing was a weighty one, and it was heavy on his mind. They were good-looking girls, young and good-looking, all different, completely different from each other, because they were Greek and Syrian and French and Italian and light Egyptian and Yugoslav and many other things. But they were all good-looking. All of them were good-looking and handsome. The piece of paper had come back to the stag now, and they had all written on it. Fourteen strangely written names and fourteen telephone numbers. The stag looked at it slowly. This will go on the squadron notice board, he said, and I will be regarded as a great benefactor. William said, it should go to headquarters. It should be mimeographed and circulated to all the squadrons. It would be good for morale. Oh, mon dieu, said the dark girl. You are crazy. Slowly, Stuffy got to his feet, picked up his chair, carried it around to the other side of the table, and pushed it between two of the girls. All he said was, Excuse me, do you mind if I sit here? At last, he had made up his mind, and now he turned toward the one on his right and quietly went to work. She was very pretty, very dark and very pretty, and she had plenty of shape. Stuffy began to talk to her, completely oblivious to the rest of the company, turning toward her and leaning his head on his hand. Watching him, it was not so difficult to understand why he was the greatest pilot in the squadron. He was a young concentrator, this stuffy, an intense athletic concentrator who moved towards what he wanted in a dead straight line. He took hold of winding roads and carefully he made them straight. <coughs> then he moved over them with great speed and nothing stopping him. He was like that. And now, he was talking to the pretty girl, but no one could hear what he was saying. Meanwhile, the stag was thinking. He was thinking about the next move, and when everyone was getting toward the end of their third beer, he banged the table again for silence. Mademoiselles, he said, it will be a pleasure for us to escort you home. I will take five of you. He had worked it all out. Stuffy will take five, and Jamface will take four. We will take three Garys, and I will take five of you in mine, and I will drop you off, one at a time. William said, It is the chivalry of the military. Stuffy, said the stag. Stuffy, is that all right? You can take five. It's up to you who you drop off last. Stuffy looked around. Yes, he said. Oh, yes. That suits me. <laughs> well, you, you take four. Drop them home, one by one. You understand. Perfectly, said William. Oh, perfectly. They all got up and moved toward the door. 
the tall one with dark hair took the stag's arm and said, You take me? Yes, he said. I take you. You drop me off last? Yes. I drop you off last. Oh, mon you, she said. That will be fine. Outside, they got three Garys, and they split up into parties. Stuffy was moving quickly. He got his girls into the carriage quickly, climbed in after them, and the stag saw the Gary drive down the street. Then he saw William's Gary move off, but it seemed to start away with a sudden jerk, with the horses breaking into gallop at once. The stag looked again, and he saw William perched high up on the driver's seat with the reins in his hands. The stag said, Let's go. And his five girls got into their gary. It was a squash, but everyone got in. The stag sat back in the seat, and then he felt an arm pushing up and under and linking with his. It was the tall one with dark hair. He turned and looked at her. Hello, he said. Hello, you. Ah, she whispered. You are such goddamn crazy people. And the stag felt a warmness inside him, and he began to hum a little tune as the Gary rattled on through the dark streets. The end. Yeah. That was a weird story. Very strange. <laughs> It was good. Yeah, nice happy ending. Had a happy ending. Yep. I like the part about the bosoms. <laughs> <laughs> How they waggled. <laughs> it was that part was exceedingly well written, and I really thought that was hilarious. It was pretty funny. It's true. And I found the passage on the internet, and I'm going to read it to everybody once this is over. <laughs> Very nice. Enjoy. Oh my god. I think I'm too tired to go sledding. I'm very sleepy. But this is probably the last chance of the season to go sledding. Yeah, I can never go sledding outside. I'd have to go travel to go sledding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it snowed like eight inches last night, so... That sounds awful. It's no, it's great, inches. because today was wow. like 50 degrees. Oh, yeah, that's sounds horrible. Yeah, it was definitely a horrible day. here. That was great. It was hot this past weekend. I don't know, it would be pretty cool if it were 75 and the ground were covered with 8 inches of snow. That happens pretty frequently in Boulder. It was more like 50 here today, but it was sunny and really nice. What's the problem with that, Fiona? Just no. <laughs> That's all you have to say. What's wrong, Fiona? What's the temperature like, like where you are? Um, I mean. Not freezing. Yeah, that sounds cold. I like this. Yeah. So, Colorado's gotten more snow in April than any other month so far. Damn. That sucks. It's kind of bizarre. <laughs> So the ski season has uh, like <laughs> just like said. By the way, you know how we said we closed? Yeah, we're gonna open up again because we got six feet of snow this week. Hmm. That's, that's, awesome. that's awesome. I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, we. We call it six feet of snow in a week. That is nuts. Not not in Boulder. In Boulder, we probably got like three feet in a week. That's much more manageable. It's a lot of snow. Yeah. I like not having snow. <laughs> it's great. The snow melts in like 24 hours, which is also very weird. Yeah. We had a blizzard in New Jersey like uh, six months ago, or maybe a little longer than that. 
For the past three weeks, every week it snowed on Monday, basically, and it's been like <laughs> seven the other week. So the snow's just in time to like say, by the way, guys, it's snowing, so I don't feel like driving into work. I'm gonna work from home, and then it gets to the weekend, and it's nice. It's all right. It's a kitty. Hi, kitty. I like the oh, kitty. There he is again. I like the kitty. Everyone's staring at your kitty, but it's not him. Is Pete still yeah. dead? Yeah, he's just oh. teasing us. Teasing us with the cat. We should, uh, we should awesome. drop the kitty on his face and record the reaction. Yes! That would be fantastic. Kitty! Alright, make it purr. You must know how to do that. Work your kitten furry magic on it. <laughs> oh, cats. <sighs> yeah. I need to get a kitty after I move. I don't have a kitty. I want to either get a kitty or a corgi. <laughs> get a get a, a mix. <laughs> I don't think you can do that. I don't think it works that way. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I don't think you can get cat dog hybrids. Well, corgi hybrids are pretty cute. Did you ever really see the video of the corgi that was the most excited corgi you've ever seen? Yeah, where he's bouncing he around. Bounces like this, like. Oh, yeah. that's what's, that's what's. Did anyone see the corgi beach party? Yes, I saw that today. Wait, awesome. what? I did not see that. I was yeah. supposed to like. 140 corgis got together for a beach party. Damn. Damn. I think I'm gonna watch that. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit excessive, almost. I'll watch that in a bit. Actually. Yeah, after you go studying. Uh, <laughs> I don't think studying is happening. Okay. Have to wait a whole year. Too oh. sleepy. Probably until October. No. I think I'm gonna go to bed now. Alright. Alright, alright. Alright. Good night. Bye. <sighs> I guess Stacy already got an idea. Nope. Did Stacy fall asleep? Yeah, I think Stacy's been asleep for quite a while. Wait, who's asleep? Stacy is yeah. still in the hangout. Is she? Stacy is 100% asleep and in the hangout. <laughs> I'm seeing her in the hangout. She left group chat like a while ago for us. Oh, oh maybe it's just glitching out for me then. Yeah, we have her on screen but with her eyes closed. Oh. We have, yeah, I have that she left the group. Yeah, me too. So I have a juggling performance on May 15th. And then I have a marathon on May 19th. And I have San Francisco this Friday. Flood travel. Nice. I am going to be very busy. Yeah, good luck. So far, I can run about yeah. two miles. I need to be able to run four. That's a lot. I have to do it while juggling the whole time, and this is going to be... Impossible. Tiring. <laughs> you can do it. We have faith. So, Jesus, you been juggling at all? Have you done a six shower yet? Nope. Every once in a while, I'll juggle a little bit to make sure I can still sort of do five. Good. Juggle for maintenance. Yeah. How's climbing? We went yesterday. 
Hey, Bergen, how are you? Hi, uh, I climbed an 11 AB, although it was stemming, so it doesn't really count. It was what? Stemming. Oh. Yeah, it was a PR stemming <laughs> problem that didn't require any hand strength whatsoever. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I climbed a 510D that was actually a 510D. I've climbed two of them now. Cool. Uh, I am not getting any better at climbing, Jesus. I haven't been since we went after I bought the shoes. Yeah, everyone's a failure. Jesus, yes. I haven't gotten any better since about last October. Yeah, well, that's because you don't care. <laughs> I climb like three or four times a week. Oh, do you? Do? Really? Yeah. Nice. What level do you climb at? I don't know. Um, I don't really know. I climb at whatever the level I'm climbing at. <laughs> How long have you been doing that for? Since October, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I took a break for like various things when I left the state, but yeah, you should be pretty good. Huh? Yeah, how long of a break have you taken? Like a week and a half, two weeks. I probably took a month break at some point, but I still haven't gotten any better, really. Okay. A month break, then you're definitely not overtraining. Well, actually, I probably gained like 10 pounds, so that, oh. I might be getting better, just been getting weight at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that could be a lot of it. <laughs> it gets harder with weight. 10 pounds is yeah. significant. Yeah. I mean, I've been climbing like three times a week, probably, probably three times now, and also running because I need to get up to four miles. Now, you're gonna be jacked. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still getting <laughs> ten pounds of muscle. muscle. Well, we were, we were reading studies yesterday about how alcohol fucks up your recovery. Uh, oh yeah, alcohol is the worst stuff for recovery. <laughs> so might interesting. Well, I have uh, some alcohol sometimes. Just a little bit. That's. Yeah. There's quite a few calories in beer, too. Yep. For example. They don't list them on the beer. But Racer Fire probably has about 200. Yeah. Yeah. No, you think there's only 200 calories in a beer? Probably. In a heavier beer, there's going to be more. Yeah, like a imperial water. stout, 12 ounces is probably going to be like 300 calories, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh oh, you guys are robots. They're no, robots. Robots? No, no you're resolution robots. Internet connection problems. We're back. It's <laughs> yeah, to itself. <laughs> a little surprised we maintained connected with the head of the hangout. That you got with us. Came yeah. close. Looked close. But, but okay, I mean, Jesus, maybe I, I mean, I haven't cared as much about climbing during the winter because it's like, oh, this is the winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you've been climbing. Well, yeah, I'm not really improving much, I guess. But like, if you plateau for a couple months, that's not anything to worry about. It's a pretty short amount of time. Yeah, I've definitely plateaued for about six months. Yeah, well, the other thing to do is to change the type of climbing you're doing. Like, are you that could be it. All I've been doing all spot bouldering. Yeah, so you should do some top rope thing for a few months. Maybe yeah, that costs extra money. It does. Uh, not if you go outside. That's right. <laughs> and it's nice out now, so I mean, okay. not right now, but probably like Thursday. So it's actually kind of tough to get a good workout climbing outside. To what? To get a good workout climbing outside. Oh yeah, it's it's true. You know, come to Mission Cliffs with us when you come to San Francisco. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I mean, during Beer Adventure, we climbed twice out of the six days, which was kind of impressive. And definitely a first. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. There's a really awesome gym in Ann Arbor, by the way. You guys are frozen again. Oh, we can oh. hear you. Seems oh, fine. You this back. Side. Well, yeah, the gym in Ann Arbor has this awesome, like, stalactite, like, hanging from the ceiling with this huge thing. And you have to, like, <laughs> there's, like, a, there's, like, a lead route that I obviously did not do. But <laughs> <laughs> you end up having to, like, I think you have to, like, do a crazy reach from, like, the wall, like, way over to the stalactite, like, the bottom of the stalactite, and, like, get under it, and, like, put your feet, like, way up where your hands are, like, all the way up there. Something like that. Or you can just dine it to it. Like, I saw somebody, like, leap at it and fail and take a pretty good lead fall, I think. Nice. It's pretty now, cool. Yeah, the gym in Miami that I've been to has a similar feature. I like that feature. It looked really awesome. They opened a new bouldering gym, actually. It's just an exclusive bouldering gym in uh, San Francisco here. It's not too far from them. Huh. Uh, it's supposed to be the largest bouldering gym in the world. Cool. It's somewhere. Yeah, it's really ridiculous. It has absurdly high walls. <laughs> yeah. Like huge high balls? I was a little intimidated on falling. I didn't want to fall that many times. How, do you, yeah. how would you compare it to like the spot, the the highest wall, the spot? Um, could be a little bit higher than that. Just about everybody downtimes rather than jumping off in the top. Everybody what? A lot of people would just downtime rather than fall, like jump off at the top. Jeez. <laughs> okay. But you can actually jump off. I always jump off. Just kind of scary. <laughs> Well, I went there once to check it out. Okay, cool. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess I should remember to bring my shoes and harness to SF. Yes, you yeah, should do that. Right. <laughs> and remind Chris to do that as well. So I just got my shoes resold also. Um, oh. It cost me $52, and my shoes originally cost me $72. Yeah, resoling can work out like that. Yeah, but it basically made them a brand new shoe, so... Yeah, yeah. and now they, they fit your feet instead of having to break them in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Also, I got a ridiculous deal on these shoes, too. These, like, these shoes were half off, so... Yeah, I got my shoes for $40 off. Nice. Mine were $70 off. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty nice. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the image on again. Hmm? Uh, buy for free. <laughs> what? I didn't hear that either. They're ridiculous. Their internet is. I'm probably failing. Bad. Yeah, where's Google Fiber? Why don't they put Google Fiber? Seriously. In San Francisco, that's where Google has too many laws. So Google doesn't control San Francisco? Is that what you're into? Like, well, how is that? Mountain View isn't a wholly owned subsidiary of Google. Oh, there's like 10 billion other really awesome companies in there yeah. that we have to compete with. Hey, how about we all just move to South Korea? Yeah, all of them want Google Fiber. Well, yeah, it's going to Arizona, Arizona next, exactly, right? I heard that it's going to Arizona next. It's probably Utah. Utah, Utah is getting some fiber because Utah already has some fiber in place, but their uh, company like started going down or something. And Google bought them up. No, it was, uh, it was the city-owned thing, and the laws they they got. Oh, city owned. Yeah, the city of Provo, Utah owned it, and Google is buying it from them because they got some sort of lawsuit against them from the major cable companies saying uh, that you're not allowed to compete in businesses as the city. Because that's that's enough. There's a bunch of those cases where the city tried to invest in infrastructure, but the cable companies like said, fuck you. 
Well, I don't care about you guys. What is Google Fiber coming to Colorado? Yeah, that too. Never. <laughs> <laughs> no. Why would you do that? <laughs> the final bug says bug. Colorado has not explicitly been blacklisted yet. <laughs> Please fix this. Because uh, this code is not actually Google Fiber. Oh, jeez. Yeah, they tell you the Colorado Google office or that Boulder Google office just has like climbing holes and ropes, like rope art everywhere. Like there's this really cool abstract yeah, rope art that like went from like the middle of the floor and like went up to the ceiling and like went like it was like forty ropes and to like make an art nice. in the middle of the office. It's pretty sweet. Right. And then you keep climbing until I have forty spare ropes. Um, oh, well, apparently you can just get a bunch of free used ropes around here. Um, just uh, Eric, for example, got like a giant bag of ropes. He got like a dozen ropes for free, <laughs> and he's been making rope art with them. Like he made a the thing you wipe your feet a doormat. He made a doormat with one. Well, yeah, I've seen that before. Cool. Was, Should send some to Fed for use as belts. Yeah, he still does that. Oh, we haven't seen right. Fed in like three weeks. Yeah. Is Fed coming to things during San Francisco? Yeah, it's Fed. <laughs> you tell him to do things and he does them. Yeah, it's done. Okay. And when everyone is telling him to do things, he especially does them. <laughs> yeah, I would expect Fed to show. I don't know okay. how many things I'm is actually going to end up being able to do. Yeah, you're going to be working during the week. Uh, par yeah, my parents are coming in on Friday for the weekend. Ah. Uh, uh, and then, yes. yeah, I have work, and it's hard to get to San Francisco. So one day we're coming to uh, near you, but I don't remember the day of the party. I forget the schedule. Uh, I think we said Friday. A week from Friday was going to be the party. I have to plan for that. <laughs> yep. Definitely do that. I was All right, I'm going to leave this thing. No, I'm going to see you on Friday. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's good. Yes, sir, I do. Later. <laughs> Gates, you survived your first game of Dota 2. You should let us teach you how to play that game. It's pretty crazy hard. I played, I played like one game before, and then that was like two months ago. <laughs> It's it's not intuitive. Like everything it's ridiculous. Like it's so yeah. we learned during college in the face pretty hard. Yeah, it's it's a little bit. If you want us to explain the game, like there's just a bunch of like like things you won't figure out from just playing it. Like because they are not figure outable from just playing it. It's got this weird dynamic to it. So if it interests you, it's not just like kill the shit until you're higher enough level to kill the bigger shit. No, it's not. Uh, it's a thinking <laughs> man's game. Yeah, it's got, it's got this funny dynamic where the there's a bunch of little shit which is like not really dangerous, and then there's the other players, and other players are really dangerous. Yeah, I noticed that. And. It, so the whole idea is to just be stronger all the time as quickly as you can. And so it, it works out to this. Uh, you're frozen again. And yeah, it's tricky. There are like guides you can read on the thing, but yeah. basically you need someone to disappoint. Point out kind of like general Hopefully ideas as well. What you're supposed to be doing in gold. <laughs> it's the hard game I've ever learned to play. Um, it's it's just crazy difficult. <laughs> um, it's there's no way to describe. But it, it, it is if you have a good game, it is an extremely satisfying game uh, because no not no game plays like teamwork like Dota. Like teamwork is such a an 
integral part of the game, and it's not something that's an integral part of any other game you've ever played. Even like Left 4 Dead, the teamwork in Left 4 Dead makes like is just nothing compared to what Dota requires for teamwork. Yeah. Uh, and it's. Well, I'll probably play. I'll probably play a few games every now and then. Yeah. So we used to play a lot in college. Um, yeah. I played a bunch after college. I don't play that much anymore. So if you're interested in playing, just send us an IM or something like that. All right. Mm -hmm. My friend and I last weekend started playing Dungeon Defenders again. So. That's what, we're what is that? I've never heard of that. Is it? It's uh, it's like a tower defense game. Mm -hmm. Those are fun. I like tower defense games. It's a lot yeah. of fun. And this one, too. this one lets you like run around and kill stuff while the towers are also defending. So, oh, that's cute. You can build like a DPS build or a strong tower build through your character. I don't know. I like. Uh, second year of grad school, one of my friends and I played it like all the time. Like, I have, I had ninety four hours clocked in it. Now I have ninety nine hours after last weekend, clocked in Dungeon Defenders. So, cool. I don't know. I guess I got like, we got super hooked on it. And we're like looking at the best strategies and trying to get all the best items and stuff. Nice. It was fun. And so we all started new builds, and then after everyone left, my one friend and I remained and just used our old power builds. And actually, he, he played on, uh, Faraz played on Xbox, so we made him get it for the computer. And so I had like a level 74 character, and over the course of Sunday, he made a new character that we leveled up to level like seventy two. Yeah. That was, nice. Like he got to he got to like level thirteen or something after our first game. That was fun. Um, I don't know. So I'll probably be playing that for a while now. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, other than Dota, I don't very play many, many video games. Yeah. Um, this is the, last weekend was the first time we played through Trine. games for a long time. We played through Trine recently. That was pretty good. Nice. I've heard I have that. I played it a little bit. I never got very far. I just like yeah, I play I play Arkham City when I want to play a game. Usually that's what ends up happening. <laughs> Cuz I can never decide what I want to play, so I just play more Arkham City. Uh. What? Have a good night. Good night. Uh, yep. Yeah. Good night. Out. I'm gonna walk over there. Good night. All right. Good night. I should probably go to. I'm super tired. I don't know why. I was thinking of getting. With you. What? Yep. You can take Bye. Uh, I was thinking of getting whiskey for the formal party. So that I can use the ice balls. Make a bunch of ice oh, yeah. balls. And then we drink whiskey. That's true. You were making some new ones when I was there, right? Yeah, I put... Um, I don't know, I haven't checked on them. But I wrapped the balls in a towel when I put them in the freezer, like the hint page recommended. Yeah, so it should be perfect this time. I hope so. That'd be fun. And then they'll come out. I'll need to make a lot of them. Yeah, it might be everybody gets one. And yeah, everyone gets to have a ice ball. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, 
Somebody is going to be juggling the ice balls, I guarantee it. <laughs> Just want to let you know ahead of time, in case that changes your plans. <laughs> well, and so if I the have ice balls kid, may fall on the floor and shatter if it's a hard floor. If it's in my apartment, maybe I won't allow that. If it's in the club room, I think it would probably be okay. Right. I don't know. We'll see. I ordered a tuxedo today. Damn. It's a big commitment. Yeah. Well, my friend from Santa Barbara and I are having oh, yeah, a yeah. contest. When is that again? Um, June 14th is the night before they graduate. So I'm getting them a bottle service and we're dressing in tuxedos. Sweet. But this was this was the same place from the other suit I ordered, but it was uh, Ives St. Laurent. It was like a four thousand dollar tuxedo that was on sale for seven hundred. Oh wow! So that's not bad. Yeah. So I ordered it, and then I spent like the rest of the day at work freaking out because I don't think I'm responsible enough to have a four thousand dollar piece of clothing. <laughs> oh come on! It's only a seven hundred dollar piece of clothing. Yeah, and that's how I eventually. That's what I eventually convinced myself. It's like, okay, it's four thousand, but I paid seven hundred, which is much more reasonable, and is exactly what I budgeted for it. Yeah, normally sure they get a bunch of thousands in profit, but yeah. the suit itself is worth even less than seven hundred. <laughs> True. So you can just like run around until it catches on fire and not worry. <laughs> I'd rather not. All right. Well, you can do it once you've worn the suit a few times. Yes. Yes. Did you put any outrageous flourishes on it? No, it wasn't custom ordered, so I have to take it. I'll have to take it in to like get the pants hemmed and have a few alterations made when it comes, but it's just standard, just very fancy. Yeah, black, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm excited. It should be here by Saturday. All right, we need to step up the quality of events we go to, so you can have some. Yeah, stuff. I know. I have to. We have to get stuff that I can wear a tuxedo to, not just a suit. Let's go to the opera. All right, that works. Do you even wear a tuxedo to the opera? I feel like a suit might be more appropriate. Depends on like what kind. I think. I guess it depends on where we sit. If we get our own like box. Oh, that's true. The own box is the difference. Yeah. Set up. So that's the solution. You two have to get a box at the opera <laughs> that we'll go to. Awesome. I'm up for it. All right. This would be like the equivalent of raising my rent by 30%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Well, after I move and my rent goes down, I might join... Uh, like the San Jose Social Club. Oh, is that like a building? Yeah, there's like there's like the top floor of the Knight Rider building or something. Knight Ritter building or something. Has like the San Jose networking club and its dues are like I think it's seventy a month for the young professional membership, which is under thirty. So might be fun. It's got a restaurant. And then when I have guests, I can say, let's go eat at my club. <laughs> They're going to be very confused. Yes. But it should be awesome. It'll be like the good old days, like in the 20s when people were part of gentlemen's clubs. Yeah. You have to, like, have a jacket on again. Yeah. And get out of the smoking in the smoking lounge and play cards. Yeah, like it's like it specifically says, you know, we don't have a formal dress code, but you have to look nice. You can't wear jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah. Excellent. 
<laughs> so it seems like right fun. in. Huh? I said you'll fit right in. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. Probably go to bed. That's right. Good plan. So, good night, good sir. Good night. Happy to have you again. Yep. I'll probably see you our sometime this weekend. Crazy upcoming or, events. Yeah, events. We could do board games with the people sometime. Yeah, that would make sense. We definitely have enough board games to support it. Yeah. Well, we got a board game that goes up to what eight players, I think. Fortune and Glory. Oh yeah, I want this just ridiculously flexible. Yeah, it's got co-op. It's got single player. It's got up to eight players versus the board versus each other. Play in teams. Play it versus another board game. <laughs> All right, my friend. Later. Okay. Good night. Good night.